I think yeah. it's just we are one or two weeks behind. I was yesterday thinking about um, being epigeneticist. I was thinking about environment phenomena, and it's it looks like there is a because in Pakistan we saw a peak in June, I think, immediately after the month of fasting. So in the June we saw a peak, uh, deaths as well as you know hospitals got full. Then a month later it got flattened and. As a nation, we know people were not taking care of SOPs. We are pretty mm -hmm. Italian style, you know, Sicilian nation. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, then it got flattened and luckily we don't have high mortality. We did see high infection, but we saw curve flattened and, you know, no infections anymore. But since last week, we start seeing, you know, more than 2% of infection rate, you know, all, although we are not doing as many tests as uh, advanced countries are doing. So as scientists, I was thinking there could be a environment phenomenon here, you know, the maybe uh, cooler temperatures are coming back, humidity could be is high, our bodies uh, maybe are, uh, you know, in, moving into different mode. So maybe some epigenetic phenomenon is involved here that is changing, <laughs> changing, you know, temperatures and environment. Yeah. We are yeah. more prone to infection now. Maybe, maybe. I mean, I guess it's uh, here it started when the temperature really dropped. Uh, and I think people are more and more going inside. Before they did parties outside. So they, because the, the numbers were very low in Germany, I think they all said, wow, it's almost gone. Let's party, especially the younger people. And, and many traveled. You know, Germany, this is a, a region where people need to travel. So, so we are really the people of travels. And so they traveled. Um, and they traveled also in regions that then became real high risk regions. So they brought the virus back to Germany. And then again, the younger people, they were all partying, but they were partying outside. So I think it was okay, but now they're going inside. And now it's, it's much more dangerous with the aerosols, with being more closer together. And, and so that's, I think, the, the biggest problem right, right now. Mm -hmm. Schools are opening up again. So now you have all the children in there. I mean, yeah. the schools are closing because you have infections and they're opening up again. It's, it's, it's yeah, crazy. And let's see what's happening when we are opening up the university. The university is closed for students since spring. Hmm. Yeah, we are same here. So we went in lockdown. Uh, university was closed for students in March, uh, hmm. last week of March. And since then we are having everything online. Hmm. Students are complaining a lot. Uh, students are, you know, there's a lot of pressure to be back on campus but uh, we did not allow and this semester is going on uh, online mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately our labs also remained closed for six months or so uh, that was a big loss for us uh, yeah. when i talked to people in uh, uk they said you know there was lockdown but we our lab activity with sops was going on in from june onward uh, mm -hmm. how was in your side about so, we, we clo so I closed the lab for about two or three weeks where we just worked from home. Um, but then we were allowed to uh, go back in, but only do basic stuff. So we did some PCR work. Um, so, and, and I had to take all my students. Uh, I had postdocs and so on. I have a relatively large institute, so I could put them in different rooms so that I can ensure they are working alone or pretty much alone and there's not so much contact. So we, we did that and that worked. And then gradually, I think in, in April, May, we were really back on track and, and could work full time again. Uh, lucky you. So it means even during the lockdown, you, you just labs yeah. were closed just for three weeks maximum it was just few, for a few weeks max closed completely and then we got back and and it was very slow in the beginning but then it got better and better uh, uh -huh. and we were allowed to work i think we were our university was over conscious there were only two people were allowed to flip flies uh rest of the labs not even someone was allowed to come in only professors could come and you know do something little uh, yeah we moved our office computers back homes we established offices there 
and started writing or you know thesis phd thesis etc mm -hmm. yeah. so it means despite having low infection rate in pakistan we were at, at least in our university we were uh, overreacting i think and we yeah, are lost yeah time. but maybe you will get through now the this this pandemic through the winter time and through the colder time much better than than we are i, I let's see i mean i don't know yeah. Yeah. i'm But it wasn't a complete lockdown in Germany. I mean, the, the, you could, I mean, there was a lockdown for maybe two or three weeks where the shops and restaurants and everything was closed, but then they also were able to open up. So first these uh, kind of shops, then the restaurants, then the pubs and so on. Um, and, and we could go out. It's just that we shouldn't contact each other privately, but mm -hmm. um, it, it wasn't complete kind of shut down like you had in other countries yeah. was more yeah restricting contacts and and locking down for for just uh, a very limited time period so i think i can start introducing you okay. it's 12 okay. o'clock now and people are uh, abdullah are people coming in still okay so i start introducing professor hake and then uh, we start. So thank you, uh, Sandra. It's a real pleasure to have uh, Professor Dr. Sandra Haig today with us. Uh, she did her PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Immunology. Uh, then she moved on to serve as postdoc with uh, Dr. Liza Denzin at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and uh, David Ellis at the Rockefeller University. Um, her research focuses on identification and characterization of post-translational modifications of histones uh, and the histone variants. From 2006 to 2016, she was an independent group leader uh, at the Biomedical Center at LMU Munich. This is the same place where uh, Peter Becker uh, is, who gave talk last week. So currently, uh, Professor Haig is a full professor and executive director of Institute for Genetics at the Justice Liebig University in Gießen in Germany. And this year, she was also appointed as vice president of German Genetic Society. Uh, among others, she is also vice speaker of the DFK. Uh, this is German Research Foundation funded research consortium, uh, TRR81, uh, which is about chromatin changes in differentiation and malignancies. Uh, and she has played integral role in Gender Equality Commission as well. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Haig, for being with us, for spending <laughs> time. Uh, so today she is going to talk about uh, histones and histone variation, uh, variants. Uh, thank you, over thank to you, you Sandra. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for this in invitation. Uh, I think this pandemic is, of course, very very horrific, and, um, and 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 many people are suffering. Uh, there's maybe one little positive thing we can think about, and this is that we are now as scientists uh, coming together much more often because we we kind of uh, in discovered our virtual tools and we can have now virtual meetings and so it's a pleasure for me to at least virtually be in Pakistan and uh, meet my colleagues there so thank you so much Tariq thank you so much Abdullah for the invitation it's great to be here um, I hope you can all see the screen uh, that I'm sharing and also the mouse yeah okay perfect so um, as you already heard I will tell you about histones and how much variation we actually do need. And um, of course, uh, I, I wasn't sure whether also some students, beginners kind of uh, will be here. So a little introduction I thought is important to bring you all up to date on histones and especially on histone variants. So, so please come with me uh, on the journey into our nucleus, into the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell, which you can see here. And as you know, in the eukaryotic cell, you find our genetic information. And that is packed up into, as you all know, this uh, chromatin fiber. And uh, chromatin is not only a packaging material, uh, but it also has much more, much more functional component. 
So it consists of uh, nucleosomes, and you all know a nucleosome uh, is a histone octamer of these uh, canonical histones, so H3, H4, H2A, and H2B. And wrapped around it is 145 base pairs of DNA. And that all together is this nucleosome. Now, as I said, um, chromatin itself uh, is not there to package DNA, but it also has a regular function. So it regulates transcription initiation, so uh, to turn off genes, but also to turn on genes when they are needed. Uh, it helps with the DNA damage repair response of the cell, and it ensures chromatin stability. So that is, of course, very important also to, to think about uh, when you think about cancer and chromosome breaks, for example. And so uh, it also regulates cell cycle. And uh, when we think about it, we always thought that, uh, of course, processing of RNA is uh, happening after transcription, but it remains close to chromatin. And now we know that a lot of RNA processing um, processes actually uh, are regulated by chromatin itself, such as splicing. Now, all of that contribute, of course, to processes like differentiation, development, and to the response to outside stimuli. Now, the, 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 the very, the, the easiest view on how chromatin can do that is by thinking that you are regulating the accessibility of the DNA. So thinking that chromatin, if it is packaged up very closely, uh, now transcription factors have no accessibility to the underlying DNA. So genes in these regions cannot be very easily uh, turned on, while in this more open euchromatic structure, as we call it, here transcription factors can bind and, for example, turn on genes. This is now the simplified, the most simplified view. But it also tells you that uh, there must be mechanisms that can regulate chromatin structure. And uh, there are several we know of. Um, there is, for example, the methylation of the DNA itself at CPG islands. Then you have also chemical modifications, post-translational modifications of the histone proteins. Uh, you have um, enzymes that need ATP to remodel, so to, to move around nucleosomes, something that also Peter Becker is working on, uh, and there are non-coding RNAs, regulatory RNAs that affect chromatin structure. And what I want to talk about today is kind of what we are focusing on in the lab, and is this is the role of histone variants in diverse biological processes. Now, it's very easy to say histone variants, these are histone proteins, but they have specialized functions. So just a little overview about what are kind of canonical histones and what are histone variants. So when you think about the canonical histones, you usually find them in, in all organisms that, that they are clustered. So you have, uh, for example, here, this is what I mean with a cluster. So you find H2A and H2B genes together, H3 and H4 genes together. They all come very close together. They're regulated very, in a very similar manner. And you find them, come and these clusters come up uh, in a location in many, many arrays. But it's not only on one chromosome, as you can see here, but also on other chromosomes, at least in humans. So you have many, many canonical histone genes. While the genes for histone variants, you, you see that there's uh, only one gene, uh, and this is on a single location. You find it only on one chromosome. When you now look at what happens when these genes are transcribed, you find that canonical histone genes, they usually only have an exon structure. So they do not have any introns. Uh, and they're expressed in a replication-dependent manner. So uh, only during S phase, when, when the DNA is replicated, so you have double the amount of DNA now, you of course need more histones. And this is why these canonical histones are then expressed during S phase. The RNA that is built uh, contains a stem loop structure, not a poly A tape. And now in contrast to that, many, not all, but many histone variant genes actually contain introns. Um, so you can have alternative splicing, giving rise to different histone variant proteins. And these histone variants, they express replication independently. So they are there all the time. And this is important because these histone variants have, as I said, specialized functions. So the cell needs them at all, at all times. And this is why it has to be ensured that they're expressed every time, all the time when you need them. But they're expressed at low levels usually. 
and they have these regular poly A tails uh, that we all know. Okay, so when we think of these histone variants, so what can happen? Why are they so interesting to us? So when we think about these nucleosomes here, uh, they contain now these canonical histones. So you can now exchange canonical histones with these histone variants. And when this happens, three different things we can envision can happen. So on the one hand, by putting in a particular histone variant, you can change the nucleosome structure completely. So we have seen that for certain histone variants that now less DNA is wrapped around such an octamer. So you have a longer linker structure, kind of more accessibility for different transcription factors. And also in addition, these octamers a lot of times are very unstable. They fall apart very easily. So again, you get more accessibility for transcription factors to certain regions. So on the other hand, these histone variants that differ of course in amino acid sequence from their canonical counterparts. So you change the histone code. You get different histone modifications at certain sites. And this of course have an impact again on binding to other histones, on binding to DNA and on the recruitment of other proteins to specific sites where these histone variants are now deposited. And then thirdly, and this is what I think now we are getting into that, uh, is that we have particular reader proteins that only bind to nucleosomes when a certain histone variant actually is present. And this is something we are also very interested in to find and identify these proteins that only bind to nucleosomes containing these histone variants. Okay, so we are working with the human cells so in the human system. Um, and uh, you can see here, this is the histone complement, histone variant complement of humans. You see that there are most histone variants found in the H2A family, followed by the H3 family. Then there are some, these are mostly testis specific H2B variants, and then recently a newly discovered H4 variant. Now we are working on several of these histone variants in humans, but uh, what I want to talk to you about today is our work on the histone variant H2AZ. So H2AZ is evolutionary conserved. So all organisms that have been analyzed so far from these uh, uh, eukaryotic parasites like trypanosomes up to yeast to plants and up to humans, all of them contain H2AZ. Uh, and in higher eukaryotes, this histone variant is essential. Now in mice, for example, when you knock out H2AZ, these mice, these embryos die very, very early during development. They are dying so early that you can't even get any, blast, uh, any uh, stem cells out of them. Now H2AZ, uh, a lot of groups in the world are working on H2AZ. And the more we, we, we get to know, uh, the more enigmatic the histone variant actually becomes. And I think very interesting it becomes because it is in principle involved in all DNA-based processes you can imagine. So groups have shown that you need H2AZ and its deposition uh, to activate certain genes. But other groups have shown for other genes that it is needed for their repression. So how can one histone, little histone protein do so different things. Uh, then it also seems to be playing a role in chromosome stability. Uh, it affects the cell cycle, in particular mitosis. Uh, it might play a role in aging. There are some hints to that, but it's not quite clear yet. Uh, in plants, I think it's beautiful that it has been shown that it's a thermosensor, so it can sense temperature if you want uh, and uh, helps with the expression of genes uh, needed for flowering. So this is then when it becomes, when you're coming out of the winter time that you actually get flowers then in spring, summer. And uh, what I think is also important and clinically uh, relevant is that in many different cancer types, H2AZ have been found to be overexpressed. And uh, together with a good friend of mine, Emily Bernstein, we actually could show that it's overexpressed in metastatic melanoma. Uh, it can serve as a marker of metastatic melanoma. Also patients that have most of it, uh, they will die much more rapidly than others. And we got an idea on how H2AZ actually regulates cell cycle and drives cancer cells into very extensive proliferation. Now, 
our question, our starting point in the lab actually is how can H2AZ, such a little protein, influence so many different biological processes? And our hypothesis is that um, it might recruit different chromatin modifiers to specific genomic regions. And this depends on the surrounding chromatin environment where the histone variant actually sits. And so when we think about it, H2AZ is deposited into chromatin by particular chaperone complexes. We're also working on those. So they actually determine where this histone variant should go. So it's not deposited everywhere in the genome, but it sits at very particular regions where it fulfills its function. So once you exchange now an H2A, H2B dimer with an H2AZ, H2B dimer, you now have a nucleosome containing the histone variant. Now we think that there are now complexes that only bind to these nucleosomes when this histone variant is present. And these might be also enzymatic complexes that play a role in remodeling, in histone or DNA modifications. And so they can then modify the surrounding chromatin environment. And by doing so, they will allow or repress transcription of these nearby genes. And again, if you regulate transcription, you can regulate development. And this is maybe also the reason why these mice die that early if you do not have H2AZ. It regulates differentiation process, cell cycle, and so on. And I think it's quite clear if you have mutated or deregulation of the histone variant itself or its chaperone complex members or these binders, this can lead to diseases. And this is what, in the end, we hope to do by finding out more about this histone variant and its interactors that we also understand how diseases might develop. So to understand what factors actually bind to H2AZ nucleosomes, uh, we teamed up with a group uh, of Matthias Mann at the Max Planck Institute in Munich, so fantastic uh, mass spectrometry uh, people, scientists. And so we generated cell lines that expressed uh, GFP tagged H2AZ. This is, of course, then incorporated into nucleosomes and then uh, took those cells, digested chromatin with MNAs, so we got mononucleosomes. And then we can pull down these mononucleosomes via the GFP tag and, of course, identify all the factors that are bound to it and compare that, for example, to H2A nucleosomes. And this is done by uh, a fantastic team of PhD students in my group, Sebastian Steffi and Ramona. And I really have to stress, these are the people who are doing the work. I'm only here to, to telling about their, these are their stories, you know. Uh, I'm just the cheerleader and the presenter today. Okay, so what did they actually find when they did these pull downs? So first of all, uh, these were uh, label-free quantitative mass spectrometry, and that has never been done for mononucleosomes or chromatin factors. And we were surprised how very well that actually worked before we used SILEC uh, to do qu uh, quantitative mass spec, but that was, was really amazing. Um, what you can see here, this is now such a volcano plot after this mass spec identification. And you can see on this side here, these are the proteins we pulled down and that are enriched on H2AZ containing nucleosomes when you compare to nucleosomes that contain H2A. And we found about 45 proteins that, that vary consistently. Uh, we did, of course, this many times, several times, and in different cell types. Uh, but consistently, we pulled down those proteins. And in red, these are now binders of H2AZ nucleosomes. And in blue, these are proteins of an H2AZ specific chaperone complex, the sir cap complex. And so that kind of showed to us that this is really a very specific pull down also we had here. So there were a lot of factors we found extremely interesting, but of course we had to focus first. We cannot work on all of them, although at the moment we are working on many of those. But what I will tell you is about our work on this protein here. This protein with this name that you can't really pronounce, an excuse for that, uh, apologize for this, uh, it's called PWWP2A. So what is this? Um, so PWWP2A belongs to the family of PWWP domain proteins. It's just uh, that it has these amino acids here in this domain. And proteins that contain this domain, there are about 
uh, 40 in, in, in humans, they are all chromatin binders. So this is a chromatin binding domain. And this is why we found it interesting. So it's conserved in vertebrates. And when we started working with it, when you put it up in PubMed, nothing actually is known. So that was interesting to us because whatever we will find, it will be new. So uh, we first looked into how can PWP2A recognize H2AZ nucleosomes. And to make a very long story so short, uh, we did many deletion constructs, FRAP analysis, competitive EMSAs, and so on. So I'm just making this very short. Uh, we actually found that it's a multivalent chromatin binder. So it does, not only has one binding domain, but it has several binding domains and it recognizes different features of chromatin. So to our surprise, uh, the strongest interaction we found was with H2AZ nucleosomes. And that was mediated by a region uh, we just called internal region because it was just internal in the protein and it has no homology whatsoever with other proteins so far. It's not structured. Uh, so we, we, we really didn't expect that, but you just need this region here and this facilitates H2AZ interaction and it binds to the C terminal part of H2AZ. Now here we have a region in this N terminal part of this internal region that actually uh, binds to nucleosomes and to the linker DNA. Um, and then a part that recognizes the modification H3K36 trimethylation this is the serine rich stretch together with the PWP domain that makes uh, an aromatic cage to actually get this modification into it. And the domain itself can also bind nucleic acids, it can bind RNA and also DNA. So we have a multivalent binding mode. So what is this protein then doing? So what actually is now this function of this binding chromatin binders PWP2? So to, to analyze that, uh, we did loss of function studies. So we uh, depleted PWWP2A with here two different siRNAs. These are controls. Uh, here two different primer pairs. And you can see in qPCR that our knockdown worked pretty nicely uh, on the RNA level. But you also can see this now in Western blot on the protein level. So the, the protein is almost completely gone in our cells. And you can also see that when you do immunofluorescence microscopy with an antibody against PWP2A, the endogenous one, you can see it's, an, it's a nuclear protein, these are the control knockdowns. And if you now have the siRNAs, you see that the protein is almost completely gone. What we noticed is that you had fewer cells. So when you do the knockdown, you had fewer cells. Uh, what we also noticed is that these fewer cells had larger nuclei something we do not understand yet. Uh, maybe somebody here has an idea. So we had fewer, fewer, fewer cells. Uh, is there a proliferation defect? And we did a growth curve proliferation analysis. And indeed, now we use even three siRNAs to independent siRNAs. And you can see that all of them actually show this growth defect, proliferation defect in comparison to the controls. So again, to make a very long story short, uh, in the end, we could pinpoint this proliferation defect to a defect in mitosis. So that was very interesting because H2AZ is involved in mitotic, mitotic processes as well. And so we thought maybe PWP2A is the mediator of this uh, process. So what is PWP2A doing in mitosis? So uh, to, to get a better idea, we did some, um, uh, movies, so live cell microscopy of either controlled or PWP2A depleted cells. Uh, we can visualize here uh, the chromatin because we use cell lines that express GFPH28. It was only for visualization. Uh, and we took pictures every 20 minutes for 24 hours. And we used Tila Kyoto cells. These are cells that do not move away. They don't walk away. So they stay pretty much uh, at these sites. Okay, so when you, we took to every pictures every 20 minutes and then got this little movie. So this is what happens in these control cells. Uh, so you see the cell enters mitosis and already mitosis is over. Sorry, it's so fast because mitosis is just one hour, one hour and a half. So you only have three stills. Okay, so what happens when you now deplete PWP2A? So the cell enters mitosis, but now you see it sticks there for a long time. 
And you see it flips back and forth between prometaphase and metaphase. And in metaphase, the chromosomes do not all align on the metaphase plate. And you see how this goes on, this flipping back and forth for 17 hours in the very long time. And you see this one is now doing, this cell is doing something I haven't seen. So it's now trying to do cytokinesis, although it hasn't divided the sister chromatids. And for us, I'm not, I'm really not a cell biologist, but for me, this was very surprising. And these, these expert told me usually mitosis is a unidirectional um, process. But what we saw here is that you can go back and forth between these two stages. Uh, we still do not really understand what's happening there. And of course, we are happy for people to suggest uh, ideas to us or work with us on that. Now you can say this is a cancer cell line um, that of course proliferates a lot. So this is why we might see defects in mitosis, okay? So we teamed up with uh, uh, the group of uh, Ralf Rupp in Munich and his postdoc Gabi Wagner. Uh, because they are working with Xenocos Levis. So this is a beautiful model system when you're looking at development. So because here you can in very short time, only a few hours, actually go from blastula to gastrula neurula and then to the tadpole stage. You can very nicely follow up all these different developmental stages. And the additional very beautiful system uh, here is that you can take a two cell stage embryo. So you just had an egg cell that was fertilized that divided once, only once. So you have two cells now. And now in one cell, you inject a morpholino. So the morpholino will um, stop translation of your protein of interest in principle. So it's similar to the RNAi, not completely, but similar to RNAi. So you can deplete your protein of interest. So you inject the morpholino in this case, PWP2A or control, together with the tracer that has fluorescence. So in this case, we use green or red fluorescent tracer. So you know what cell was injected because it's fluorescent. And then you let this two cell stage embryo develop. And the beauty of the system is when you go to the tadpole stage, you will get a tadpole that is half injected and the other half non-injected. So you have a nice negative control in itself in your experiment. Of course, you do it not only with one two cell stage embryo, but you do it with hundreds so that you get really an idea on how this, how penetrant the phenotype might be. Okay, so what did we see when we do that? So this is the control morpholino. And you can now have a view of the dorsal. So you look on top of the tadpole. So this is the complete tadpole. This is now the head and you see the two eyes and this is the mouth. And uh, this is now looking from the left and the right. And you can nicely see here, the right is fluorescent. This is where the control morpholino was injected. And the left is the wild type, not injected side. So you see, these are completely normal. So what happens when you now deplete PWP2A in half of such uh, a tadpole? So these really have a problem. The first thing we noticed is that the we get tadpoles, but the tadpoles, they swim in circles. And we saw that they swim in circles because they have these curled up tails and curled up backs here. So we wondered why they have these curled up backs. And in the end, it all came to the development of the head. So when you look at the head, you see here, when you look on top, this is the injected side, the green one, you see the complete head is missing. So there's no eye. Also you see here, there's no eye. The mouth is not really there and the whole head structure is not there. And this is why the, the tadpoles also to curl up. Uh, and this is then the uninjected side and you see the eyes there, the head is there, so that's okay. And this is the phenotype of high penetrance, as you can see here, when, when we looked at almost a hundred of these embryos and so 86 from 97 embryos showed that phenotype. And the nice thing is you can do now rescue experiments. So you co-inject with the PWP2A morpholino, we co-injected human PWP2A mRNA. So the morpholino will not target the human mRNA because the sequence is completely different, but it can be of course then uh, translated into a protein. And what we saw is that indeed we can, not completely, but to a very great extent, rescue this phenotype so that we get back the head structure, 
and that we get back the eye. And that tells us, first, this is a specific phenotype for PWP2A, it's not an off-site effect. And second, this seems to be evolutionary conserved because the human protein can rescue what the, the, the xenopus, the frog protein, the loss actually is doing. So what is happening? Why don't we get any head structures? So uh, Ralf and his uh, postdoc and Gabi, they did a lot of stainings. I'm just showing some here. Uh, and what we first looked is because we didn't get any eye structures. We looked for markers for eye development. You see them here in the control and you see them also here in the knockdown. So, so these marker genes like RX1, they were expressed and you find them expressed at the right places at the right time. So, so that's not really the problem. But in the end, what we found is that uh, markers for cranial neural crest stem cells, there we found a difference. And uh, they are there, you can see here in the knockdown, you, you get these darker patches, so this is twist here, but usually in the, in the wild type situation, they would move from one direction during development to these regions, to their niches here, and then they get signals and they start to differentiate. And what these cranial neural crest stem cells are doing is they are making the whole cartilage, they are making the whole head. And so we think what is happening here is that these cells, we have less and that they don't migrate. They don't go and get to their niches. So they don't receive the signals for differentiation. And in agreement with that, is when we look at cartilage and this is control, you see now the head and the cartilage of this frog, of this, of this tadpole, and when you now, this is the injected side with the control morpholino, everything is normal. When you now do the PWP2A injection here, you can see there's no cartilage at all. So, so you, you just don't get the, 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 the head, you don't get any facial structures. And we think this is very interesting and we are looking into that a little bit more closely because there are several uh, craniofacial defects also in humans that are known. Uh, where for some of those, it's really not known what the genetic defect is at the moment. So, so maybe, just maybe, don't want to claim anything, but maybe there are also mutations or deregulation of PWP2A expression in those defects in humans as well. We will see in the future. Now, how bring we, can we bring this together? So we have this very strong mitotic defect in human cells, okay? We have this very strong neural crest stem cell differentiation migration defect in the frog. So very, very different phenotypes. And we, we were scratching our heads what's happening. And so one thing is what we thought is, okay, maybe there are genes that are involved in these processes. And so maybe PWP2A regulates the expression of those genes. So we did knock down and did then transcriptome analysis this is now done in cell lines, not in the frog, just to, to make sure. So we knocked down PWP2A again, uh, and we did RNA sequencing two days after knockdown. And what we found is that here in red, you see these deregulated transcripts, we found about 700 genes that are actually deregulated. And, and what we found is about half of them are up, half of them are down, okay? Um, when we did geoterm analysis of those genes, we found that they belong to the group of uh, regulators of metabolism and processes involved in metabolism. And what we found very interesting and more easier to us, uh, for us to look at is uh, genes involved in migration. So that, that was kind of interesting because of the frog phenotype. So when we look at those genes, and this is now just some genes here in this list, very, very short list, uh, which actually are downregulated. And you see here on position four, PWP2A is now, of course, uh, the fourth strongest downregulated gene. And you see there are several here in this downregulated genes that actually are all involved in some step of actin polymerization. We found this very interesting that these are the most downregulated genes. So why is this interesting to us? Because on the one hand, it's quite clear, actin polymerization, you need for cells to migrate. So in the frog, we seem to have a migration defect. So maybe this could be the cause. And now there are new publications, or new, but there are now several publications that also implies 
that there's actin involved in mitosis. So that you need actin to actually get your spindle shortening. So that actin promotes spindle shortening and that you actually get your sister chromatids separated. So maybe in our cells, you, you have this very strong mitotic phenotype because these are very highly proliferative cells. And now in the frog, we see more the migration phenotype because this is what actually happens during development that these cells have to migrate very strongly. Okay, so first we confirmed by qPCR that our RNA sec data, at least of some of those we confirmed here, we, 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 we looked at, we confirmed that they are actually downregulated, uh, so that fits. Uh, we now looked at here one of those CAPSA1 that is downregulated after pwp 2 a knockdown. We also found that the protein is gone after pwp 2 a knockdown, so that kind of makes sense. This protein really is gone. So what is this CAPSA1 doing? So CAPSA1 is uh, a protein that sits on the barbed end of polymerase of, of, of actin fibers that are polymerizing. So what it does, if it goes to the barbed end, it prevents polymerization, okay? So stay with me. So usually CAPSA1 sits there and it prevents polymerization. Now we are depleting PWP2A, we are losing CAPSA1, so we have less CAPSA1. So the idea would be we get more polymerization, okay? Can we measure that? We tried, it's not easy, we tried. So we did staining for actin. And this is now a control. Uh, and you see here, these are the similar, pic the same pictures, it's just that here we have F actin in red. Uh, together with DNA in blue and PWP2A in green staining. And here you see in gray, this is just actin. Okay, now when we do, when we do knock down PWP2A, what I think you can see, you see PWP2A is gone, is that this actin staining appears much stronger. You get much more of these fibers. They look to me a little bit like stress fibers. They, they are stronger, they are more, they, they, they look thicker, they look different. But it's very, very difficult to actually quantitate this. We, we, we tried a lot, it's very difficult. Um, but we, we have the hinge, every time we look at that, we, we did also blind um, counting and, and ordering of all the students, they got all the pictures and they ordered all the knockdowns in one group and all the controls in the other. So we think there is something to it. But again, it's very difficult to quantitate. So if there is something to it, and actin has something to do with the, polym with the, with the spindle shortening, how do our spindles look like now in mitosis? So these are now uh, 3D sim pictures of mitotic cells. And uh, what you can see here is a tubulin staining of the spindles. And I think it's very beautiful. You can very nicely see the different spindles and the different spindle types. These are just two different mitotic cells in metaphase. Now, when we new look at our knockdowns, I think what you can appreciate is that these spindles are thinner, they are kind of elongated, uh, they are not really much in shape. They, they yeah, they, they, just, they, they just look like they really have a problem. We also find more of these spindle kind of maybe fragments surrounding it. So something is happening with the spindles. And we think this maybe is the problem. And this is why the cells where the, where the sister chromatids do not align properly um, in the metaphase plate. And so we, we, you just can't get them separated. And this is why the cell maybe tries to go back and forth to realign, get the spindles back on. But this is just the hypothesis. Now, if actin is really affected, is there also a phenotype in migration? So uh, here, cells were transferred. These are now, again, um, Life cell microscopy pictures after we did a scratch. So we had a scratch here. This was the same size. We ensured that. Um, and these are cells that express GFPH2A again for visualization. And we have controls and we have the two PWP2A knockdowns. And so we took pictures again um, over a time frame of 24 hours to see how this, the, the cells actually move. Uh, and these are now cells that do not move a lot. These are still these HeLa Kyoto cells that, that do not move a lot. We have to do that still with cells that move much more. Um, but already what you can see 
is when we start this, and this is now, um, again, putting all these frames together, it's now the same time frame, what you can see here. And I think it's quite clear in the controls, the cells, and this is now stopping, they kind of, uh, in the same time frame, they move very close together, while we still have a very strong gap here in the knockdowns. And we can quantify this different experiments. We see these cells appear to have a migration phenotype. We have to do more experiments because, of course, we have to think that these cells also have a mitotic phenotype that comes into that as well. So we, what we want to do is single cell tracking how these actually move, one cell moves without going into mitosis over a period of time. So then when we have these phenotypes, when we have the transcriptome being affected, how can PWP2A do that? it does not appear to have any enzymatic activity itself, okay? It just has these, these chromatin binding regions. So first of all, we checked where do we find PWP2A? So we did some chip sequencing and I apologize, it's a very busy slide, but it just tells you very simple things. So these are replicates. So you find PWP2A, you can see it here in the green line. And when you find PWP2A at sites, you also find H2AZ at these sites. Okay, so they come together. So that's nice because we saw it's an H2AZ binding protein. And now we have markers here to distinguish between regulatory regions. And so we find PWP2A in principle at all regulatory regions. So we find them at promoters, we find them at active and at inactive enhancers. And this is why we also find H2AZ there because it's found at regulatory regions in our genome. Okay, so we have it at enhancers and promoters. We find it very, very weakly at gene bodies where it might interact with H3K36 trimethylation. So what is it doing there? So we thought it cannot act alone. And so we did now a pull down and the interactome of PWWP2A itself. And again, label-free quantitative mass spectrometry of mononucleosomes, but this time with PWP2A. And it worked very nicely again. And what you can see here in blue, these are all the proteins we also identified in our H2AZ pull down. So many of those come together. So we think they might be coming together at the same sites or even in complexes. And then we have some that are just coming down with PWP2A, so these ATRX and PWP2A and DAX, for example. But what we found very interesting are here in red are these proteins because they belong to the NERD complex, the nucleosome remodeling and deacetylase complex. So this is a complex, if you want, consisting of two subunits. So there's the basic subunit with the enzymatic HDEC, histone deacetylase activity. And then you also have kind of a subcomplex with the remodeling activity here, CHD, so you can move around nucleosomes, for example. When you look more closely, you see that PWP2A only interacts with the HDEC subunit, but not with the remodeling subunit. This was something that people have predicted that you have these two different subunits if you want. And we actually could show for the first time in vivo itself that they really exist in these two parts. So we only have the HDEC part and we could find out why this is. So just again, long story short, we found the interaction of PWP2A, which you see here is this colorful, uh, this is Ramona's uh, picture, this colorful uh, worm, if you want, uh, that, that binds to H2AZ nucleosomes here. We found that these protein-rich regions in the N-terminal part interact with the MTA1 subunit and only with MTA1. There are also two and three and they do not bind. So only with MTA1 and by that recruiting the RBPs and the HDACs. But the binding site between MTA1 and PWP2A is the identical one as for MBD2 that also binds to MTA1. And so if PWP2A binds here, it prevents MBD from binding and MBD usually recruits the remodelers. So this is why we have this kind of, yeah, exclusive binding to just this region and not the remodeling part. So that we think happens at regulatory regions, promoters and enhancers. So thinking, now PWP2A recruits this HDAC, this enzymatic activity. 
So do we see then any differences in histone acetylation when we remove PWP2A? So you lose PWP2A, so you lose the HDEX. So if you lose HDEX, you should get an increase in acetylation, okay? Because you can't take it away anymore, okay? So we did knockdowns and then chip for H2AZ acetylation because this is where PWP2A binds and H3K27 acetylation because it's a marker for regulatory regions. And indeed, when we look at sites where PWP2A is found, so promoter and enhancers, we see at promoters, there's no change. Here's two replicates of, of control knockdown and two replicates of PWP2A knockdowns. There's no change. But at some enhancer regions, we now see that the acetylation of K27, H3K27, and also H2AZ, the acetylation actually increases now. And this we do for many now. And every time we see a change, we see that actually it's an increase. And this increase is for H3K27 and also for H2AZ acetylation. So is this now influencing transcription as we would predict? Yes, somehow it's, it's difficult because we have to bear in mind, we are looking at enhancers and we do not know what, these, what genes these enhancers actually are regulating. So we looked at the nearby genes and for some of those nearby genes, we actually saw a change. And every time we saw a change, it actually, it's an upregulation of those genes. What we would expect, you have more acetylation, you get more open structure and you get an upregulation, but it's not for all nearby genes. So it might be that we, we, these enhancers might regulate other genes. So this is why we, we see an increase by some of those nearby genes, but not at all of them. So this brings me to our uh, kind of final working hypothesis at the moment. We have found PWP2A as a novel interactor of H2AZ nucleosomes. Uh, we, we found that it's a kind of multivalent nucleosome binding protein. It recruits um, this core nerd complex with MTA1 uh, that only contains the HDEX, but not the remodeling functions. And by doing so, we think at regulatory regions, these ATEC, HDEX usually help to take away the acetyl marks. And by that fine tune, we think it's not an on off state, it's a fine tuning of transcription, okay, to dampening down transcription. And these are in particular genes that, among others, course, help, for example, by actin polymerization. And these are, of course, processes important for cell migration and also mitosis. And this is kind of how H2AZ is also involved in, for example, mitotic processes. Again, an hypothesis. Now, I think I'm done with my time and I've told you a lot about our work. So I want to skip the last part because it's, I think, going to be uh, too much. But I want to, of course, have the most important picture of all. And this is this one here. And this is that I want to thank, of course, the people who are doing the work. It's not me. I'm not in the lab anymore, which I think is very sad. I would love to be in the lab. But uh, they are doing the lab. And I have a fantastic team. I showed you the work by Steffi, Ramona, and Sebastian. Um, and now uh, here in Gießen, um, I have uh, several other people who took over and kind of are working now also on other h 2 az binding factors where we found, I think, some very, very interesting new features. Um, we have uh, fantastic collaboration partners who are helping us like Ralf with the Xenopus or Joel is doing structural analysis NMR work. Uh, and so on. So it's it's just fantastic. And I want to thank, of course, the people who are giving the money so that we can do this work we are doing. And uh, thank all of you for your attention. And uh, I, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm happy to get any suggestions. Thank you very much, Sandra, for an excellent talk. Um, I love the data. Uh, <laughs> thank you. H two Z is always a puzzle. <laughs> So let's start questions. Abdullah, are the so audience, please feel free to ask questions. Okay, I can start with. So uh, 
Sandra, this uh, neural crest uh, phenotype, did you see in the facial phenotype you saw in the xenopus? Mm -hmm. uh, did I understood correct, understand correctly that that is due, a migration defect uh, and that link that is linked to the actin polymerization because neural crest cells, they move uh, mm -hmm. a lot during development, early development. Yeah, so this is at least our hypothesis. So we see that we have the markers for the neural crest stem cells, they are there, but the cells are not at the right position where they should be. So it looks like they do not migrate, they do not move to the niche where they should go. And uh, so we think that they have a migration defect and because they don't migrate there, this is why they don't receive the signal for proper differentiation. This is our hypothesis at the moment. And, and this is why we think this actin kind of would fit into that so that they can't migrate anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Abdullah, are yes. there questions yes. online? Sir, I have a question. Yes. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so uh, my question is that uh, if you have looked uh, for the transcriptional expression of actin, if the PWWP is affecting the uh, actin mm -hmm. at the transcriptional level or only at the polymerization level, mm -hmm. because that will also add another uh, thing to the data that PWWP mm -hmm. is uh, affecting it at the transcriptional or translational level. Another question, uh, the follow-up question is that um, if you have looked at the nucleosomes with which the PWWP2A is associating, if these histones have H3K27 acetylation, uh, increased acetylation or methylation, because that will also add to the transcriptional activator or repressor role of PWWP2A. Mm -hmm. Two very, very good questions, absolutely. So from all we can tell, actin transcription itself is not affected. Uh, also, when we look, look at the total actin level, protein level, uh, just monomers and so on, we don't see a difference. So to us, it looks like it's really the polymerization. So you have monomeric actin proteins there, but the polymerization is affected because the proteins that regulate the polymerization, they are affected by transpired depletion of, of PWP2A. Um, and the second question, uh, we have done uh, pull downs. So we expressed PWP2A also recombinantly and then added mononucleosomes from cells to this PWP2A and then did mass spectrometry to look, do we have an enrichment of certain modifications? And um, so we, we do not really find H3K27 trimethylation. We find acetylation. And the strongest enrichment we find for modifications, actually, when we compare it with different domains and so on, is uh, H3K36 trimethylation. And this is binding to this PWWP domain. So this is all I can tell so far. Uh, yeah, so um, because as per my knowledge, H3K36 trimethylation is an activation mark uh, for transcription. However, your data is telling us that knocking down PWWP2A uh, is leading towards increased acetylation, which is contradictory to the methylation levels. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm wrong or correct me, uh, please. No, you have a very good point here. So there, I... I so the story is much more complicated. So you, since it has a multivalent binding mode, um, PWP2A, so it binds the strongest to these regulatory regions. And this is because of H2AZ, because H2AZ is sitting there. Um, and there it looks like it really binds to that the strongest. But it can also bind to K36 trimethylation, and this is in gene bodies. So there's another study by the Neil Brockdorf group. So they also have looked at PWP2A and they did knock down or knock out uh, cells um, and they did chip sec. So they found the same things like we did for the most part. They also found NERD, they found these differences. So they, they found very, very similar things like we did. The main difference between their and our study is the chip sec data. We did native chip sec. So we didn't cross link at all. We just, because it binds so strongly, I've never seen in FRAP such a strong binding protein into chromatin. This is why we figured just make mononucleosomes and send it for sequencing. I mean, we pulled down tons of it. 
and we find it at this H to AZ regulatory regions and very, very, very little in the gene body. We find a little bit, but very little. Neil Brockdorf, they did double cross-linking chipsec. So they, they cross-linked twice, but with two different cross-linkers and then did pull-downs. Uh, and they found now increases in gene body. And I think it's because you, I think in the gene body, PWP2A is more on an off, on off state because it binds to K36 trimethylation, but not as strongly as to H2AZ. And we lose it when we do um, our native, cross, native chip sec, and they found it now. Now, HDK36 trimethylation is on active gene bodies, but it is actually a repressive mark because it, it, it prevents um, cryptic transcription. And so near Borkdorf, they showed that PWP2A also plays a role in the transcription of the whole gene. I mean, K36 trimethylation is more in the end. Um, yeah. And that they found um, some problems when you now deplete PWP2A over the transcription over the whole gene body and cryptic transcription. So they saw these defects, but they were very minimal, I must say. We haven't looked at those, so I can't say. For is what obvious we saw these mitotic defects uh, where we focused on, they went for the polymerase. So I think there's more, there's much more to it. We just covered a little part of it, of course, but you're absolutely right and your questions are very good. So thank I have you. a- I hope I, I answered it. I hope I answered yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. So I have a follow-up question. Uh, I think it's coming to my mind from maybe paper or review I read long time ago, looking at your data where it is affecting enhancers and the H3K27 acetylation and it enhances. Can this H2AZ uh, be one of the essential factors in boundary as, as a boundary element, you know, where it maintains uh, correct genome organization of genes which need to be fine-tuned, be it active or, or repressed, because it's playing dual role. It's also, you know, from uh, mm -hmm. the previous question, it's also having a role in uh, transcription elongation, K36, and then it's also recruiting uh, the HDAC nerd complex, which is the repressive role. Mm -hmm. So can we think of uh, PW, uh, PWWP2A plus H2A as kind of a fine balance in the genome as boundary? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. I mean, we have checked, uh, the, the, the only thing we did is doing ATEC-C just to see whether something is happening with the nucleosomes, but there we didn't see any difference. Um, we haven't done any 3C, 4C, 5C, and so on, high C experiments, just to see whether also uh, the architecture uh, and the boundaries are, are, are um, different. Um, it, it, it is possible. It is absolutely possible. I think there's just a paper coming out that should suggest that H2AZ plays a role in that. Uh, whether PWP2A is also involved in this, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. We have- yeah, we have go. some, we have, so we have, I, I didn't show that. These are all unpublished data then, which I, which I didn't show now, but uh, we found some other proteins now also in the interactome of Z and PWWP2A um, that might play a role in chromatin compaction and chromatin structure. Mm -hmm. And and this is for us pretty exciting. Um, and so Maybe it's not PWP2A itself, but maybe it's another factor that is also recruited there that might have the role play a role there. So, but it's very early, but at the moment we are looking into these cells and we can't believe what we are seeing at the moment. <laughs> so. Yeah, so uh, one more question I have is um, in, in the mass spec data, I saw there was, uh, I think that was the mass spec uh, done for PWWP2A interactome. There, there was, I think, PWWP2B as well, I could see. Uh, is it, yeah. a, so the, 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 how much homology is there? Is there redund a redundancy there? Do you think that may have uh, had an impact? Uh, 
in knockdowns. So PWP2 yeah. and B also has a PWP domain, but they're not very similar to each other. And uh, when we do, for example, h 2 pull pulldowns, we do not pull down PWP2B. So we only pull down PWP2A. But PWP2A, um, and this is what Neil Brockdorf actually could show, interacts with PWP2B. But we think this interaction takes place in the gene body where there's no H2AZ. So this is now the K36 trimethyl part where PWWP2B is binding. And maybe this is also why, I mean, we find HRX and DAX, which we find interesting as well. These are H3.3 chaperones. So maybe this is also something that's happening in the gene body. Um, so that is now the H2AZ independent part. I mean, of course, you start from a histone variant, but then you find complexes that, that are there. But you also find then factors when you look at them more closely that have other functions as well. Um, but in the end, uh, we, are, we are working on several of those factors now. And we are doing the same thing here, knockdown, chip sac, um, RNA sac, um, interactomes, so that we in the end get kind of a 3D map of our genome where these complexes are sitting and what functions they actually have and how they regulate transcription. And of course, it's all much more complicated than, than we all think. Um, but, but this is what, what we are trying to do. And PWP2A is just the first step. Yeah. Abdullah, are there other questions? Mm, yes, we have a question from Dr. Mustafa. Dr. Mustafa, you can ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Actually, my, uh, I am overwhelmed at this time. And also, my question is already presented to you. I'm, I don't, I'm not feeling very good from Najma. She has actually beaten me with the, her question. So, uh, but I have, a, I have a, a thing to ask from you. I, actually, I'm, it's an anxious sort of question. Uh, after uh, looking at the evidence that uh, uh, something is going to influence uh, enhancers in general. I mean, the next thing which should come into my mind is to hunt down the specific genes. I mean, who knows how many wonders are actually out there? How many, how many regulations which are related to disease and other things are actually because of those things? So what is in your mind? Uh, this is something I want to know. Maybe the hunt is already on the way. So what's in your mind? How are you will going to track down the specific genes from here on? <laughs> it's a very good question. It's a very difficult question. Um, of course, with the RNA sec, uh, after knockdown, you find many genes that are deregulated, but these are direct and indirect genes, of course. Um, so, of course, we would like to do more, uh, for example, 5C mapping so that we get an idea, these enhancers, where do they actually go to, what genes do they touch, what promoters, what do they actually regulate, and I think that would give us a good idea. At the moment, um, since there are already um, these kind of uh, 5C, high C maps available for many of those cells here, also HeLa cells, um, we might be able to get an idea by looking into that. But our bioinformaticians, they first have to get an idea on how to, de to do the analysis. Uh, but, but that might be a first clue before doing any experiments. But yeah, okay. it's, but, but I want to stress, I, I really think it's... Um, it's, it's a balancer. It's, it's kind of like enhancers. We, we are not turning off or turning on transcription. And I think it's kind of a fine tuning. It's, it's mm -hmm. these, these acetyl groups and the differences we see is that you do a fine tuning because people um, were very surprised that when they looked at HDACs, and there's not only HDAC 1 and 2, but there are many, many different HDACs. And when they did ChIPSEC for these HDACs, they found several of those at promoters and regulatory regions of actively transcribed genes. And so it was always like, why do you have an HDAC at an active gene? Because um, you would think they, they turn off transcription, but you find them there. And so the idea is they are there to kind of dampen it. So they take away the acetyl group. This is how I envision it. They take away the acetyl groups. And so the, the transcription goes a little bit down. The, the chromatin becomes a little bit compacter, but you still have the eight heads there. So you put the acetyl on again. So you, you still have this, this balancing act. But if you wouldn't have the HDEX there, maybe the chromatin would be getting too open and maybe transcription would be too strong or maybe even you're getting chromosome instability. I mean, these are maybe just two easy thoughts, but, but this is how I envision it. So it's a dampening. It's, it's really a fight between the hats and the HDEX to, to ensure there's only 
a certain level of transcription. And I think this is the fine tuning we are, we are doing here by recruiting these kind of nerd factors, for example. Thank you very much, Andrew, from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I have one. Go ahead, go ahead. No, please. Thank, Thank you, Sandra. Uh, I have one question. Uh, you showed that this protein is PWWP domain. So did you check what uh, is the impact of this mutation in this PWWP domain on or all this recruitment or uh, the transcription? Um, so we haven't checked on the transcription. This is something we are doing right now at the moment. We have done uh, mutants and we have done rescue experiments with those mutants in the frog. And we have shown that uh, with, for example, um, many deletion constructs, we still could get a pretty decent rescue in the frog, but we couldn't delete the H2AZ binding region, then we couldn't rescue it anymore. So the H2AZ binding seems to be, at least for the frog phenotype, very important so that the protein interacts with H2AZ and is doing something there. But we haven't looked and done rescue experiment for transcription with mutations in the PWWP domain yet. So I no, I can't answer it. It's a good question. Uh, we, we don't know yet. Uh, uh, I ask this question because uh, one, uh, one other protein that's also the PWWP domain, and it's also involved in this neurodegeneration. So mm -hmm. maybe this, uh, you, do you think that this PWW, uh, PWWP domain may be neuron specific and have a specific role in neuron development? Um, so, so the PWWP to P2A protein, we did uh, um, in situ hybridization of the different stages during embryogenesis in the frog. And we found that actually the exp expression happens uh, in these neural crest stem cells. So this is where we found the protein and that it's important later on in the head. This is where we found it. And then it's not a, such a big surprise that when you knock it down, you find also effects in particular these proteins. In humans, PWP2A, from the tissues we looked at, it's expressed everywhere, but at least in the, in the adult body. It's, it's a little bit higher in the brain, uh, from what I can tell from qPCR, but it seems to be ubiquitously expressed. So, so I can't tell if there's some neuronal specific there, specificity there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Abdullah, may I ask a question? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, um, Sandra, can we delineate that uh, this H2AZ specific or let's say PWWP 2A specific uh, role could be uh, cell cycle specific as well as in the interface as well, you know, uh, like mitosis, uh, pro metaphase and metaphase, the back and forth phenotype, which mm -hmm. means some very crucial role in cell division. And then uh, a separate or a specific function in the transcription as well, or chromatin organization, let's say. Yeah, so so we think that the mitosis phenotype comes or is there due to these uh, transcriptional defects, due to having these polymerization defect, for example, of actin. I don't think it's the only thing, but that could be a, a major defect. When we look at PWP2A, where it actually is localizing, I can show you this try to prepare some stuff for you. <laughs> in, if there are questions. Um, yeah. So we thought maybe PWP2A has a direct role in mitosis. You know, maybe it sits at centromeres and when we take it away, the spindles cannot attach at the kinetic course or something like that. So um, here you can see chromosomes. Um, uh, this in green, this is the centromere, so SEMP E, yeah. and in red, this is now endogenous PWP2A. And you see, in mitosis, on these chromosomes, most of PWP2A actually disappeared, but some, some of it remains. And it sits at specific regions. And you see it on both sister chromatids. So it's on really specific regions there. Yeah. And it's specific because when you do a knockdown, you, you lose the signal. So it, it seems to be really PWP2A specific uh, signal. I have no clue what these regions are. We would love to do a chip sack with mitotic cells. Uh, we haven't figured out how to do that. Um, 
but it doesn't surround the centromere. So we never find a surrounding of centromere. So, so we don't think there's a direct structural component um, or function of PWP2A in mitosis. I, I want, don't want to exclude it, but from that very easy view, it doesn't look like it. Yeah. Because so mitosis, yeah. mitotic phenotype is, is mind blowing. You know, I have never seen such cell. Or, I mean, cells may get stuck, they may become polyploid, they, you know, uh, when you said nuclear size is bigger, initially I thought, you know, they must be going to be polyploid, but they are going back and forth. They, they stay diploid looks like. Uh, yes, we, we checked at that. So they are not polyploid. Yeah. Um, okay. I haven't seen something like that as well. Uh, when we looked at the movies for the first time, we were sitting in front of the computer like, what's going on there? Can you explain to me what we see? <laughs> Um, and uh, and looking then at many, many of those, uh, we, we see it uh, in so many different mitotic cells. Of course, this was now 17 hours, very long. It goes, this phenotype goes from, let's say, three hours to the 70, 18 hours phenotype, uh, where they really switch back and forth. And then at one point, either they die or they, they overcome it somehow and try to divide anyhow. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen something like that as well. Abdullah, are there other questions? No, then we thank uh, Professor Haig. Sandra, it was real pleasure. I, I hope and uh, I'm, I'm confident we are going to bother you more than often uh, sitting in <laughs> Pakistan. <laughs> yeah, sitting in Pakistan, it's a rare opportunity for us to really get in touch with the people working at the cutting edge for our students. Yeah and for our faculty even uh, you know we we don't enjoy uh, heavy funding in pakistan so for us this mm -hmm. is a golden opportunity to listen to your talks and and many of our colleagues who are being generous with their time uh, and they come online and you are right i mean uh, with covid uh, it's a blessing in disguise that we are yeah. getting in touch we have discovered usually scientists i as a scientist is pretty narrow you know I don't want to do something else, but this technology has brought us together. Uh, yeah, yeah. Bundle of thanks, uh, and I wish you, you a wonderful day there. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure also to meet you. And of course, I'm happy to come back. <laughs> Definitely. Thank okay. you. So good bye luck bye. to all of you and stay healthy. <laughs> yeah. You Ciao. too. Ciao.